Um, we welcome uh, everybody, panelists uh, and attendees uh, this afternoon. Uh, I will switch between Spanish and English, uh, so will uh, panelists as well. Uh, este es nuestro sexto uh, webinario EULAC. Uh, hemos empezado con esta tradición desde el principio del confinamiento. Y eh, aunque terminemos con esto un ciclo, vamos a seguir en los meses que vienen con otras sesiones. Eh, por lo tanto, eh, quédese pendiente porque vamos a anunciar otro webinario y eso en línea con lo que es el mandato de la Fundación EULAC de promover el diálogo entre las dos regiones y el conocimiento mutuo. Eh, inauguran el evento de esta tarde la dos copresidencia del Consejo Directivo de la Fundación EULAC. So, uh, this afternoon, the two co-presidencies of the board uh, of the EULAC Foundation inaugurate the webinar. Ambassador Mauricio Escanero, uh, representative of Mexico before the EU institution in Belgium, and uh, Claudia Gintersdorfer, who is uh, the uh, head of division for regional affairs in the Department of the America in the European uh, uh, External Action Service. Um, welcome to both of you. Uh, also, we are expecting the presence of Felice Zaccheo, Head of Unit for Regional Operation in Latin America and the Caribbean, in the Directorate General for Development and Cooperation of the European Commission, but unfortunately, he hasn't yet managed uh, to connect uh, uh, so far. El panel de esta tarde estará moderado por Tania Guillén, eh, una investigadora nicaragüense, actualmente trabaja en el Climate Service Center de Alemania. Bienvenida. También nos acompaña Horst uh, Pilger, jefe de sector de la Dirección General para el Desarrollo y la Cooperación de la Comisión Europea, eh, representando también el programa Euroclima de la Unión Europea, eh, y eh, Laura Lázaro eh, Tusa, una investigadora principal del Instituto eh, Real, Instituto Elcano de Madrid, y eh, profesora del Centro de Enseñanza Superior Cardenal Cisnero de la Universidad Complutense de Madrid. Eh, y, last but not least, Colin Young, Executive Director of the Caribbean Community Climate Change Center, an international organization reuniting uh, all the countries of the Caribbean and based uh, in uh, Belize. Uh, I will pass over the floor to the Ambassador uh, Mauricio Escanero, Ambassador of Mexico uh, in Belgium, for a word of inauguration. Muchas gracias, Embajador Amadei. Señora Claudia Gisterdorfer, es un gran gusto saludarles, dar la bienvenida a todas y a todos las y los panelistas y participantes en este webinario de la Fundación EULAC con el tema Enfrentando el Cambio Climático en el Contexto de COVID-19. Ambos retos, la mitigación y adaptación frente al cambio climático, así como nuestra respuesta a la pandemia COVID-19, ponen de relieve la importancia toral de los retos globales para nuestra generación y el futuro de la humanidad y en este contexto el valor estratégico de la cooperación birregional CELAC Unión Europea y de nuestras contribuciones y convergencias en favor de un multilateralismo fortalecido 
y de una mejor gobernanza global para el desarrollo equitativo y sustentable. Celebro la labor de la Fundación EULAC como plataforma para la reflexión sobre nuestra acción colectiva en torno a estas grandes prioridades. Es una labor que habremos de continuar profundizando con el apoyo de todas y todos los miembros, socios y amigos de la Fundación. En este, el último webinario que convoca y dirige, reitero nuestro más sincero reconocimiento a la embajadora Amadei por su liderazgo y dedicación como directora ejecutiva fundadora de la Fundación EULAC. También aprovecho para dar la bienvenida por adelantado al próximo director ejecutivo, el distinguido doctor Adrián Bonilla, con quien será un honor trabajar para potenciar hacia adelante la labor de nuestra fundación. Les deseo a todas y todos un exitoso webinario y aprovecho esta oportunidad para reiterar el compromiso de México en su calidad de presidencia pro tempore de la CELAC para continuar fortaleciendo la asociación estratégica CELAC Unión Europea en apoyo a la cooperación internacional y el multilateralismo. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, embajador, también por su palabra hacia mi persona. Eso, de hecho, en mi último webinario como directora ejecutiva de la Fundación, siendo que la próxima semana ya se termina mi mandato, y el nuevo director eh, ejecutivo, Adrián Bonilla, nos está escuchando en este momento desde Quito. Eh, le paso ahora la palabra a Claudia Gintersdorfer, representante de la Presidencia de la Unión Europea, del Consejo Directivo de la Fundación, no sin antes mencionar también que este webinario se está eh, transmitiendo eh, en los canales YouTube y Facebook del programa Euroclima, eh, que eh, coopera eh, con, eh, en la organización de este webinario. Entonces, todo lo que tuvieran dificultad eventualmente a conectarse eh, vía Zoom pueden hacerlo y pueden seguir esta misma transmisión desde el canal YouTube o Facebook de Euroclima. Por favor, Claudia. Bueno, muchas gracias, Paula, y buenos días a todos los participantes eh, en las Américas. Uh, we'll switch to English now, so good afternoon. Um, it is really a pleasure for me to be here today. And uh, I just wanted to echo the words of uh, Ambassador Escanero uh, in thanking uh, Paula Amadei for her work here at the helm of the EULAC Foundation. Um, this uh, is your last uh, webinar here, but uh, it's, uh, you know, already the last of a very successful series of webinars you've organized on the theme of COVID and the different facets uh, uh, that uh, this brings. And, um, well, it is, of course, with pleasure that we uh, welcome also your successor, Dr. Bonilla. Um, but uh, really, the work that you have done to uh, move this foundation forward is outstanding. So thank you very much again. I would also like to uh, convey my thanks on behalf of uh, our Managing Director, Ambassador Edita Rada, who unfortunately could not be here uh, with us today, but also whose mandate in her current function is coming to an end tomorrow. Tomorrow will be her last day at work. Uh, and from then on, we will have uh, Javier Nino as our uh, Acting Managing Director until uh, the, uh, Edita's successor is nominated. So uh, just to say that, uh, again, um, Continuing the, the words uh, by uh, Ambassador Escanero, today's theme highlights really the importance of multilateral uh, cooperation and coordination because climate change is not something that any country can uh, face on its own. And uh, um, just as uh, the virus does not know frontiers, neither does the climate and the challenges uh, to climate change and its effects. And uh, another thing that, uh, well, the coronavirus uh, pandemic and climate change have in common is the importance of being prepared. And so uh, disaster preparedness, but also trying to prevent climate disasters, uh, 
will be uh, a key endeavor. And we have the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. Uh, we have the Paris Agreement, which are our multinational uh, instruments uh, for this. Now, uh, of course, looking at the post-COVID recovery, uh, we as EU are very much trying to implement both inside the European Union, but also to encourage our partners around the world to, uh, you know, build back better. This is a slogan which comes already from the UN in the, the 90s in the context of disaster preparedness, but we're using it now in this context, meaning that uh, really uh, the recovery um, you know, it needs to take account of its effect on the climate. So we want a green recovery that really promotes uh, clean energies, that uh, also looks towards creating new jobs uh, in this uh, sector. And uh, uh, so as Commission President uh, Ursula von der Leyen said, we will repair and prepare for the next generation. And I think, as I mentioned before, this is something that is not true for the, only for the European Union, but it's something where we want to work together with partners um, in the whole world, and in particular Latin America and, uh, and the Caribbean, to, you know, have a kind of green alliance between the EU and this region. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Claudia Gintersdorfer, uh, for these uh, words. Um, we, before giving the floor to uh, Tania Guillen, who will be moderating uh, this event, I would like also to welcome Graham Watkins, who is a acting at the of division uh, for uh, climate change at uh, the uh, Inter-American uh, uh, Development Bank. So welcome, uh, uh, Graham. So I think uh, we can uh, uh, start. Um, por favor, Tania, la palabra a ti. Hola, muy buenas tardes desde Hamburgo. Muy buenos días hasta... América, América Latina y el Caribe. Eh, muchas gracias Paola y Fundación EULAC por la oportunidad de, eh, hoy de dar el privilegio de moderar este tan interesante y necesario panel para conversar un poco sobre el cambio climático y la crisis del COVID-19 que estamos viviendo desde hace unos meses. ¿no? Desde el inicio de este año a nivel global nos estamos enfrentando una crisis que había sido quizá eh, avisada por la comunidad científica, pero para la cual mencionábamos antes no estábamos preparados como sociedad. No sabíamos a qué tipo de pandemia nos enfrentaríamos eh, y la, eh, la propagación del virus también ha sido relativamente rápida. No ha conocido fronteras y nos ha recordado también que tenemos una sola casa común y que todos y todo está conectado. A nivel global, eh, con datos de ayer, la Organización Mundial de la Salud reporta aproximadamente 10 millones de personas alrededor del mundo eh, que se han contagiado por el virus. De esas 10 millones de personas, la mitad está en el continente americano, siendo 2.5 en Estados Unidos, aproximadamente 1.3 en Brasil. Y eh, aproximadamente 500.000 muertes se han reportado a nivel mundial. Países desarrollados, así como países en economías eh, en transición han tenido que también actuar de manera urgente y con mucha incertidumbre ante la crisis. En general, con algunas excepciones, los gobiernos han basado su estrategia en información científica disponible y con la guía de la ciencia ha sido su actuación. Siguiendo el principio de precaución, tratando de proteger la salud de su población y eh, cada uno con diferentes también circunstancias y herramientas para hacerle cambio a la crisis o hacerle frente a la crisis. Esto se ha venido identificando como quizá un paralelismo con el cambio climático o la crisis climática al, eh, frente a la cual la humanidad también está eh, haciendo frente. Eh, esto, la crisis climática es cada vez más evidente, ya no es un asunto de futuro, sino es una situación actual y ha, sido, ha venido siendo reafirmado en los últimos años por la comunidad científica y especialmente por los reportes del IPCC, que es el panel de Naciones Unidas sobre Cambio Climático. Si, los científicos alrededor del mundo y la comunidad científica también nos están alertando que es imperativo 
imperativo actuar urgentemente de manera ambiciosa para evitar los escenarios más drásticos. Recientemente escuché en, un, en la presentación de Cepal, de su último reporte, una frase que me gustó y que es que dijeron, para el cambio climático no hay vacuna. A, a diferencia de la crisis del COVID-19, que esperamos haberla superado pronto, esperamos cuando esté la vacuna, si, sin menospreciar las eh, consecuencias económicas que quizá tomen más tiempo, eh, la crisis climática es de mucho más largo plazo. Es una crisis que depende de nuestro actuar hoy, y tendrá mayores o peores repercusiones en las generaciones futuras. Y el actuar frente a la crisis del COVID-19 también podría sentar las bases de lo que es una acción climática ambiciosa. En la región latinoamericana y caribeña eh, ya observamos los efectos del cambio climático, tales como sequía o inundaciones en la región centroamericana, como la intensidad mayor de tormentas tropicales en el Caribe o el de hielo de los glaciares en Sudamérica. También, y no menos importante, la pérdida de biodiversidad. La región europea también está enfrentando cambio climático. No es un fenómeno que actúe solo por una región, sino que es también un fenómeno global. Y, por ejemplo, estamos en, viviendo una primavera, verano, relativamente seco, lo cual puede dar pauta a un tercer año de, de sequía. Eh, para, en, en, en cuanto a eso, el IPCC eh, en su reporte publicado en 2018 de los 1.5 grados de calentamiento global nos dijo que para cumplir nuestra acción y que esté en base al objetivo del Acuerdo de París tenemos que hacer acciones urgentes y transiciones rápidas en todos los sectores de la economía, principalmente el sector energético. También nos señalaron que esta transición debe ser basada en criterios de equidad, de justicia, de cooperación y por medio del trabajo conjunto entre gobierno y ciudadanía. La pregunta es, ¿no ¿está dando la crisis del eh, COVID-19 una pauta de las acciones que debemos tomar para el calentamiento global? Por ejemplo, recientemente se reportó que la cantidad de dióxido de carbono emitida por actividad humana durante el confinamiento más estricto que fue en, a, en abril, re, eh, pudimos observar que hubo un descenso de las emisiones de hasta un 17%. Eso, eh, de, eh, reducción de emisiones de carbono, también se tradujo en la mejoría de la calidad del aire en muchas ciudades y en mejores eh, condiciones en las ciudades, por ejemplo, menos tráfico vehicular. Lamentablemente, después de esas drásticas reducciones, también ya se están reportando, por ejemplo, en China, un aumento de las emisiones en un 4 o 5% comparado con años anteriores para mayo. Entonces, hoy en este webinar nosotros queremos compartir y escucharemos de nuestros panelistas reflexiones sobre cómo se relacionan estas crisis y cómo podemos crear sinergia y cuáles son las oportunidades que nos están presentando para la acción climática. Asimismo, conversaremos un poco, y no menos importante, sobre la cooperación birregional entre eh, la Unión Europea y Latinoamérica y el Caribe. Para ello, la Fundación EULAC ha coordinado un excelente panel que Paola ya lo, lo mencionó anteriormente y yo voy a ir presentando a nuestros panelistas a medida que vayan tomando la palabra. Y tenemos tres guías principales, las tres preguntas. ¿Cuáles son las principales lecciones que tomaremos de la crisis del COVID-19? ¿Cómo pueden nuestros planes e inversiones para la recuperación económica ser amigables para el clima y estar alineados con los objetivos del Acuerdo de París? ¿Cuáles son las oportunidades de cooperación entre América Latina, el Caribe y la Uni Unión Europea para construir un futuro más sustentable y resiliente? Como un pequeño anuncio logístico, queremos compartir con los participantes que este webinar está siendo grabado, como comentaba Paola anteriormente, será puesto a disposición también posteriormente en la página web y en las redes sociales. Y si tienen preguntas, les pedimos que la hagan, por favor, en el espacio de preguntas y respuestas en el chat y le pediríamos a nuestros panelistas que respondan en la manera de posible en, en, en el mismo chat y si no, intentaremos en los últimos minutos retomar quizá preguntas eh, que hayan quedado. También el webinar está siendo una combinación entre inglés y español, no tenemos traducción, eh, y los, nuestros panelistas tienen la libertad de, de presentar en el idioma que se sientan más cómodos, y nosotros intentaremos siempre eh, sintetizar los mensajes principales. Y para dar inicio... 
eh, me da gusto poder presentar a Lara Lázaro Toura. Lara es investigadora del programa de energía y cambio climático del Real Instituto Elcano. También es profesora del Centro de Enseñanza Superior Cardenal Cisnero de la Universidad Complutense de Madrid. Lara nos compartirá reflexiones relacionadas a las preguntas indicadas, pero también desde la perspectiva de qué retos nos enfrentamos actualmente de la gobernanza climática en, en era del, del COVID-19. Muchas gracias, Lara. Adelante. Muchas gracias. Es un placer y un honor estar aquí eh, hoy en este seminario de ULAC. Eh, creo que muchos de los temas principales se han apuntado ya. Eh, sobre las lecciones eh, de, del COVID para enfrentar la crisis climática, creo que es fundamental no solo tener en cuenta que llevamos desde 1988 con un panel intergubernamental de expertos sobre cambio climático produciendo informes que cada vez con más, um, con más urgencia y de manera eh, más consensuada nos indica que el cambio climático está aquí, que su componente antropogénico es claro y que los efectos ya se sienten, sino que tenemos que actuar sobre estos mensajes. No lo hemos hecho eh, todavía, las emisiones eh, no han llegado a su pico y sabemos que para limitar eh, los peores impactos del cambio climático tenemos que doblar esa curva, esa curva de las emisiones. En segundo lugar, no estamos preparados para enfrentar estas crisis globales que si no son simultáneas sí han estado concatenadas. La crisis sanitaria, la crisis económica y la crisis social, unas crisis que van a requerir, como ya lo estamos viendo, eh, por los paquetes de estímulo, de, por ejemplo, de la Unión Europea, una respuesta rápida, una respuesta a corto plazo, pero también una reconstrucción, eh, además de building back better, quizá building forward better también, ¿no? en, en esta doble acepción. Para ello, eh, desde una perspectiva geopolítica, tenemos que caminar hacia una cooperación sincrónica cuando la geopolítica nos dice que estamos enrocados en un individualismo um, diacrónico, por lo menos en, en Estados Unidos, ¿no? Tenemos eh, pues una administración que duda de la existencia del cambio climático y de su componente antropogénico, eh, que bueno, desde los inicios pues ha estado mm, uh, con el objetivo de eliminar aquellas eh, políticas que se consideran innecesarias, como el Clean Power Plan eh, de la administración anterior, eh, con China, que bueno, habiendo sido China y Estados Unidos los principales arquitectos del Acuerdo de París, vemos que China eh, pues no está dando unas señales claras de cómo va a ser su segundo NDC, su segundo compromiso determinado a nivel nacional no ha indicado que en su estrategia a largo plazo se vaya a poner ya una fecha más tarde de 2050, lógicamente, para alcanzar la neutralidad en carbono. Todavía no está claro cuán verde van a ser los paquetes de estímulo. En la Unión Europea sí está más clara la apuesta, como se indicaba eh, por parte de, del Servicio Europeo de Acción Exterior, con ese primer paquete de rescate de 540 billones eh, el presupuesto reforzado de 1,1 billones, eh, perdón, 540 mil millones, equivalentes a 540 billones eh, anglosajones, el presupuesto reforzado de 1,1 billones o 1,1 trillones en términos anglosajones y eh, este instrumento de Next Generation EU que va a dedicar 750 mil millones a, eh, bueno, pues a esta reactivación para la salida de la crisis, ¿no? una reactivación que tiene que ser hacia eh, pues los nuevos retos a los que nos vamos a enfrentar. Son paquetes de estímulos sin precedentes y eh, la ventana de oportunidad para redireccionar los flujos financieros y ajustarnos al, al objetivo 2.1c del Acuerdo de París, de alinear los flujos financieros con los objetivos climáticos, es probable que no vaya a haber eh, mucho más espacio si no aprovechamos esta oportunidad. El liderazgo, además, como vemos eh, con estos análisis de, de parte de los grandes emisores, pues está el liderazgo climático fragmentado. Eh, esto lo que nos aboca es a tejer unas redes eh, más fuertes en cuanto a un liderazgo climático más distribuido. Eh, las redes que ya existen, pues, 
coaliciones como de la gran ambición o redes más técnicas como la red iberoamericana de oficinas para el cambio climático o el programa Euroclima Plus en el cual se está haciendo una labor eh, muy importante de difusión de las políticas climáticas a nivel internacional podrían ser una, una avenida, una vía de eh, mejora y de aumento de la ambición. Con lo cual, para terminar la respuesta a esta primera pregunta, la idea sería, necesitamos una cooperación en el plano de las ideas, una cooperación ideacional, necesitamos activar más la palanca financiera, es decir, no solo a través de, de, los, de la financiación climática internacional, sino también de programas, por ejemplo, como el Plan de Acción de Financiación Sostenible de la Unión Europea y eh, la recientemente publicada y Taxonomía, que es una guía para eh, saber qué proyectos están alineados con nuestros objetivos climáticos. Y también eh, la expansión, quizá, de la agenda climática hacia otros ámbitos que están enmarcados dentro del de, eh, análisis de los límites planetarios ¿no? y que también son de importancia clave para países como China. Y aquí me refiero a la agenda de la biodiversidad y el apoyo que la Unión Europea puede dar a la COP15 que se va a desarrollar el año que viene. En segundo lugar, ¿cómo pueden los planes de inversiones eh, para la recuperación ser amigables para el clima? Aquí eh, las últimas investigaciones, y aquí estoy citando el, el último documento de trabajo de Cameron Hepburn y compañía de la Universidad de Oxford, se analizaron 700 políticas de estímulo que se pusieron en marcha desde 2008, desde eh, después de la gran crisis financiera de 2008. Eh, es importante recordar que después de esa crisis financiera, de todos los paquetes de estímulo, solo el 16% se asignó a recuperación verde. Eh, hasta ahora el, el análisis nos indica que eh, de los primeros, de la primera respuesta que se está dando ahora en 2020 a la crisis, el 4% de, esos, de esas primeras respuestas han sido verdes, el 4% um, han sido marrones si se quiere y el resto eh, pues han, han perpetuado el, el status quo. Eh, con lo cual tenemos esa oportunidad de mm, ver qué qué elementos, qué inversiones tienen mejor comportamiento a efectos de impacto positivo para el clima, eh, nos traen empleos más rápido, porque esto es algo que es una preocupación muy importante. En España, por ejemplo, podemos esperar tasas de desempleo eh, del entorno del 18% este año, con lo cual aquellas inversiones que, además de ser positivas para el clima, eh, no dejen a nadie atrás, van a ser absolutamente prioritarias. Y eh, lo que nos dicen estos estudios es que tanto las inversiones en energías renovables como las, infra, como las inversiones en infraestructuras renovables y en energías renovables, aquí me refiero a solar, eh, energía eólica, mmm, me refiero a, a los vehículos eléctricos, a la infraestructura para estos vehículos eléctricos, a las medidas de eficiencia energética, todos tienen multiplicadores a largo plazo eh, significativos. Para aquellas empresas y aquellas industrias que vayan a recibir fondos públicos eh, para salir de la crisis y que no estén todavía en la transición, una de, eh, de, de las opciones que se plantea es que haya una condicionalidad verde clara. Es decir, que si van a recibir dinero público, se eh, requiera, se demande unas hojas de ruta hacia, hacia las emisiones netas nulas con objetivos intermedios verificables y con eh, unas contrapartidas si esos objetivos no se cumplen. Um, por otro lado, es absolutamente fundamental que se produzca una integración, lo que en, en la teoría se llama eh, Environmental Policy Integration, ¿no? esa integración de políticas ambientales, por ejemplo, en nuestros presupuestos, es decir, que línea presupuestaria por línea presupuestaria vayamos analizando si esas inversiones tienen un impacto positivo, negativo o neutro en el clima, quizá con criterios un poco más finos de los que lo estamos utilizando habitualmente. Y, por último, para esta segunda pregunta, también creo que sería importante eh, recordar que el acervo legislativo, tanto las iniciativas de leyes como las iniciativas ejecutivas, planes, estrategias, etcétera, etcétera, eh, 
se alineen con este objetivo de neutralidad climática. Sabemos que las leyes climáticas han aumentado en 20 veces las que teníamos en 1994, que tenemos esos, esos NDCs, que a nivel de la Unión Europea tenemos planes nacionales integrados en energía y clima, es decir, las hojas de ruta las tenemos mucho más claras de las que teníamos en 2008. Entonces ahora hay que aterrizar, hay que tener eh, proyectos que estén listos, estos Shovel Ready Projects, para eh, reasignar esos flujos financieros. Y por último, el tema de la cooperación, hemos mencionado ese liderazgo climático más distribuido con las redes que existen, quizá dándole un estatus un mayor a las iniciativas como la RIO que mencionaba anteriormente, pero también eh, quizá elaborando unos, eh, algo similar a lo que tenemos en el Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosures para la información eh, sobre la exposición al riesgo, de, al riesgo del cambio climático de las empresas, pues crear un Task Force on Green Recovery que pueda eh, ayudar a guiar las decisiones y las comunicaciones en el seno del G7, en el seno del G20 y mm, moviéndonos hacia adelante en, en la COP26 eh, que bueno, que obviamente sabemos que, que ha sido retrasada y que tiene la dificultad de tener eh, bueno, pues menos capital político ahora mismo de lo que hubiera sido deseable sabiendo que es la COP más importante desde eh, la COP de 2015, desde la COP 21. Sabemos que contamos eh, con el apoyo de la ciudadanía para una recuperación verde. Nosotros eh, hay, hay un, un análisis que, que hemos hecho recientemente en... en en España, eh, pero también a nivel internacional, una encuesta de Ipsos que eh, habla de que dos terceras partes de la población encuestada a nivel mundial apoyan esa recuperación verde, con lo cual tenemos también ese, eh, esa aceptación activa o pasiva de la ciudadanía para una recuperación verde, sabiendo que va a ser complicado y que vamos a poder eh, disponer de menos capital político para la agenda verde y de dificultades financieras, sobre todo para ciertos países. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, Lara, por eh, tanta información tan bien sintetizada. Eh, que antes de darle la palabra a Graham, queríamos eh, darle la palabra al señor Felice Saqueo. O Paola. Oh. Creo, creo. Muy buenos días, muy buenas tardes a todos y a todas. Creo que el sistema me dijo que soy unmuted, entonces pueden escucharme ahora. Sí, le ¿Me escuchamos. confirman? Le escuchamos. Ok, muchísimas gracias. Eh, lo siento mucho para haber tenido problemas, pero no sé qué pasaba hoy. Mi Zoom no quería trabajar, entonces estoy conectado aquí en, 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 con el teléfono. Espero que me puedan escuchar. Um, no sé ahora cuál, no, no puedo ver quién está como participantes, entonces no sé, lo mejor que en mi presentación la hago en inglés, mi, mi palabras de, 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 lo voy a decir en inglés, eh, así que eh, espero que todo el mundo eh, pueda, digamos, escuchar los mensajes muy breve. Muchísimas gracias. So thanks a lot. Thanks, Paula. Thanks to the ULAC Foundation for uh, inviting uh, uh, the um, webinar. I understand that my friend, Ambassador His Excellency Mauricio Scanero, has left. Uh, I hope Claudia um, um, Gintersdorfer from the IAS is still there. So um, it's a big, big pleasure to be here. I also want to greet the friends uh, of uh, Euroclima that are uh, uh, live uh, on the social media. So I think everybody can listen to us. And, um, and it's very, very timing and important to have this discussion, you know, now. And especially when uh, the CODIF pandemic uh, um, is uh, hitting uh, uh, Latin America uh, so hard now, um, it's giving a little bit of more Um, digamos, better situation in Europe, but uh, now the, the, it's really, really bad in, uh, in Latin America. And of course, uh, um, we have been concentrating 
our efforts uh, uh, for the immediate uh, response to containing the virus, uh, saving uh, the life uh, of the people. And this, I think the European Union was one of the first to react and uh, uh, contributed. There was a communication, there was a commitment uh, at the beginning of April uh, of our president of the European Commission um, that uh, went in that direction. Uh, But of course, now we have to also look at the recovery and it's the chance for the governments to show that they are capable to address challenges uh, by building a more inclusive and resilient societies for the health and the well-being of their citizens, of course. As you all know, the new European Commission, uh, when uh, it started the mandate uh, um, before uh, in, in November last year, before the outbreak of the of the of the of the COVID, um, uh, set up a number of priorities, and the priority number one um, of the uh, new Commission was the European um, Green Deal. Uh, for the coming years, um, the element, more ambition element, objective uh, of the of the of this uh, green deal uh, was to make Europe the first carbon neutral continent by 20. 20- 50 and uh, mm, the European Union, I can assure you, um, uh, have declared that will uh, remain uh, this the objective also after the COVID-19 outbreak. And we believe that the post-COVID economic recovery and the transition to a sustainable, social just, uh, resilient and climate neutral economy can and should go hand in hand with the measure we are taking to uh, support all our partner countries, including also, of course, uh, our continent to fight against this tremendous virus. Latin America and the Caribbean, of course, only contribute to around 8% of the global greenhouse gases emission. That is a similar share of the one in Europe. However, um, we know that uh, the LAC region is disproportionately affected by climate change due to the geography, social economic condition, and we know that the region is one of the most unequal one in the, in the world. But uh, arguably, the Caribbean and the Central America are severely hit by climate change, many of which a relatively many of which uh, countries have relatively small economy and suffer strongly from the negative effect, in particular by the extreme weather con- conditions such as drought, floods, tropical storms, and so on. We have seen, for instance, a clock in um, some studies show that the predictors follow in the GDP and rise of unemployment uh, due to the COVID-19 could uh, basically uh, tremendously increase the pools in Latin America. The challenge for the region is therefore fostering a green recovery that is inclusive and leaves nobody behind. So, but we do not have much time left because uh, If we want to maintain the objectives and primary goal to reduce the global warming to 1.5 degrees, the LAC region has only 11 years to make the necessary transition. This means that a green recovery from COVID-19 must be part of the plan, not the only one, but one of the uh, key elements. And of course, this is when this webinar comes uh, um, timely. And the, 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 the issue that it raises, it raises uh, how do we continue to fight against climate change in times of the COVID-19? For the European Commission, the answer is very clear. We are just as committed to climate action now, as I said before, as before. Not only in the EU, but also in all other regions, including Latin America and the Caribbean. We need to move fast ahead and urge all the countries uh, in the region to ensure that robust low carbon policies are put in place, also in the countries, um, combined with the green national recovery strategy. And of course, uh, we, moving in this direction, we will uh, attract and guide investors, businesses, uh, um, workers, consumers towards sustainability. So a crucial building block will be sustainable finance. We need to work in that sense. And this is where I think we have done a lot 
uh, in our cooperation. And when we, you will hear uh, my colleague uh, Horst uh, later talking about Euroclima, I heard also the previous um, speaker talking about Euroclima. We have been working a lot on climate change on with our investment facilities, both for Latin America and for the Caribbean. But we are planning to do more and much more. You know all that we are now. We are at the end of our current uh, um, uh, multi-annual financial framework, so the financing period that goes from 2014 to 2020. We are now entering the programming of the new financing period 2021-2027, and this will be um, you know, uh, definitely a big opportunity to uh, move towards uh, um, a, a, a clear um, uh, identification of the priority under, of course, uh, the current uh, uh, the current uh, situation. Because we started already uh, programming our or oh, discussing our future programming before. We were hit by the by the COVID crisis, but as I said before, the priorities that we had set up and the Green Deal, the clim climate change, the fight against climate change will remain, but we'll have to also put this, frame this in under the current situation. But of course, we can uh, disperse, we can have at disposition, at disposal uh, um, as many funds. Um, uh, that we want, but cooperation uh, as such will not be af enough. But we need to have also investment from governments, from the private sector, so from all stakeholders that are um, in in uh, in this. Uh, in this, let's say, challenge together with us. The European Union, of course, stands ready to engage with partners around the world on ways to direct investment to environmental, sustainable um, economic activities. And uh, mm, we will do so um, not exporting, let's say, our standards, but we have to uh, sit down together and forge global standards together. What does mean this? We, it means that we have to work um, uh, taking into consideration, having in mind alliances, partnerships. And this is why um, we remain committed in a region where we have a long-standing tradition of partnership and alliances if we take about uh, uh, if we talk about climate change uh, issues i think this is where we have teamed up in the past uh, um, uh, very well together and we want to do so and we want to continue building green alliance for a better world not only for us but of course for our generation so muchísimas gracias para Mm, uh, darme uh, la palabra, la oportunidad de intervenir muy uh, brevemente. Um, uh, felicidades uh, una vez más a la, a la, la Fundación EULAC por la organización del, del, del webinar. En um, voy a escuchar con mucho interés las la conversaciones siguientes. Muchísimas gracias, Paula. Muchísimas gracias a todos. Eh, um, muy, uh, todavía aún muy, muy buenos días y muy buenas tardes. Gracias. Muchas gracias, Felice Saqueo. Saqueo. Él es el jefe de unidad de operaciones regionales América Latina y el Caribe de la Dirección General de Desarrollo y Cooperación de la Comisión Europea. Muchas gracias por compartir los insights de cómo eh, podemos eh, a, a colaborar en este momento y, y los pasos que quedan. Eh, yo le quiero ahora ceder la palabra eh, a Graham Watkins, que es el jefe interino de División de Cambio Climático del Banco Interamericano de Desarrollo, BID. Eh, Graham, ¿nos podías compartir qué aprendizajes podemos también encontrar eh, además de, de, de la información sobre las preguntas guía, pero el BID recientemente publicó un informe justo para la región sobre cero emisiones. Eh, buenas, buenos días y adelante. Buenos días a todos. Eh, voy a hablar en inglés. La razón siendo que actualmente nací en Guyana. Entonces, Guyana es el único país de Sudamérica que, que es habla inglés. Entonces, uh, I'm going to carry on in English. I'm, uh, I would like to say thank you to the ULAC Foundation for this opportunity. 
And yeah, a lot of what I'm going to say is in fact documented in that particular paper on getting to net zero. But we also have another paper coming out uh, at the end of this month with ILO looking, looking very much at jobs and what are the implications of jobs with decarbonization. And I think that that will also add another level of direct application for the question of recovery as well. Um, at the outset, I wanted to say that I actually don't want to talk about green recovery. I want to talk about sustainable recovery. Words in English are very important, and sustainable includes the inclusive bit, uh, whereas green is more environmental. And for Latin America, I think that's critical. Uh, I also wanted to say that you know, if you look anywhere on the web now, you find everyone is talking about green recovery or sustainable recovery and all of the different options you've got there. <laughs> head of UN, head of IMF, the head of uh, the IEA recently with their publication on how to, how to do it, the, the Energy Authority. You've also got the Renewable Energy Authority saying this. You've got a lot of people talking about it. Um, we spent a lot of time looking at what everybody is saying as well. Uh, and what seems clear is that a lot of things keep coming out. One is change. This is a change. You need, we need change. The second is the role of renewables. The third is the question of inequality, of how to deal with inequality. The fourth is how to increase resilience. I think one thing COVID has shown us is that we're not very resilient. We're, not, we're suffering heavily because of the shock. Uh, we weren't ready for the shock. Um, the fourth is social protection, the need for protecting people from these kinds of shocks in the future. I think the fifth is the need for protecting financial systems from this kind of shock in the future. And the last is partnerships that is constantly mentioned as well. This, the, the importance of everybody coming together behind one direction, one vision. Um, uh, and thank you, Lara, for raising the, the papers done by uh, Professor Hepburn with Stern and Stiglitz. Uh, I mean, everybody is talking about what we need to do in the future. And, and I actually also, again, coming, coming back to words, not a big fan of build back better. And the reason I'm not a big fan of that is we're building back. We need to build forward. We need to think about not going back because there are problems with the back. What led us to this situation is the back. So we need a different world when we go forward. This is a point that actually Nick Stern makes heavily. It, the world before wasn't working, and the reason we're suffering so heavily is because it wasn't working. So the new world needs to be different, very different. So I just wanted to add, as a sort of, I would say in Spanish, antecedentes, say a few of those things. The other thing is that, that we should be positive because there is, I, I, there's a website which actually is accumulating all these green plans globally. Last time I checked, it had 50 examples of cities, of countries, obviously the EU plan, of everybody trying to re reconstruct their own areas and move forward with sort of a sustainable future. And so I think that's positive, and I think it's growing. Um, I also wanted to, to, to reinforce a couple of things and say that if you wanted to do this in Latin America and the Caribbean, it needs to take into account some very specific issues. One of those is that uh, we still have about 80% 80 80 of people live in cities. So it's got to be about cities, uh, to be honest. Uh, cities are the ones that are emitting. Cities are the ones where the resilience problems are, really. You've also got to deal with inequality. It's one of the most unequal areas, uh, regions in the world. You have to deal with resilience. That's already been mentioned, that we need to be looking at how we can make sure that we have more resilient communities going forward. And the last area is biodiversity. We are the richest biodiversity area in the world, region in the world, uh, and that's got to be part of the solution in some sense. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about what the goals of sustainable recovery could look like. I'm going to talk about what you might have to do in terms of investments to drive sustainable recovery. And importantly, I also want to talk about what has to enable that and what will keep it keep that recovery in place. This is one of the lessons that was learned from the 2008-2010 financial crisis, is that you can put impetus into a system, but if you don't change the system, then the impetus can collapse later on. The change can be lost. And I want to talk a bit about that. And then I'm going to talk about what that means for us as a bank and, and for the region in general. I have something positive to add <laughs> and three caveats, which may sound a little negative. First thing is that in that same study that Lara mentioned by Ipsos Mori uh, with the 65% of people that support a green recovery, in Mexico, it was 80%. 
which I think is telling. 66% in Brazil, but the Mexico 80%, I think, is important for the region. But I think also we need to be pragmatic. I just went onto the Johns Hopkins website this weekend, and I had a look at what the curves look like for each of our countries. They are awful. They're all peaking. They're all going up. The only two that I could find which were kind of coming down a little bit were Peru and Chile. Peru, luckily, because it, it's been a disaster for the country. The other point I want to make is that I, the estimates on the loss in, in um, GDP have been going from about, I think the first one I saw was about 3%, then it went to 5%, now it's 9.3% for Latin America as a region. That's the latest one from IMF, uh, I think, the end of last week. Uh, we have also estimated as a worst case scenario, we may lose 17 million jobs, formal jobs, and probably 23 million informal jobs. That's huge. The, the region has never seen this before. Th this has never happened before. And it's clear that social progress is going to be retarded. The poverty targets are going to be missed. Um, and there's probably going to be increasing inequality. So we just need to be pragmatic about this and real about this. And this is the situation today. This is what people, countries and governments are facing today. I also want to say that whatever solution is co people come up with or it, that will be come up with will be country specific. And in some cases, it will be city specific. But, and it'll be different from different places. They're dealing with very much with different problems. I think this has already been mentioned as well, that, that much of the early response has been focused on rescue, not on recovery. There are two phases. They kind of overlap. Um, and rescue is really about getting those emergency health things in place, the social protection in place, getting cash transfers to people that don't have jobs, uh, trying to maintain jobs, maintain liquidity in financial systems, and, and also get the fiscal elements right so that you can actually do those, those kinds of things. And that's that's been the focus. Uh, at least it's been our focus. Uh, we've committed about two, $22 billion already. Uh, I know IMF has also committed about $50 billion, but the main focus has been on those kinds of actions so far. There's not a huge space. There is a little space, but not a huge space for green actions in that. This is all about making sure people are all right today. Uh, we also need to realize, and I really want to emphasize this, this is it's like a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. And I think that you kind of need to go to the two extremes and see what the one extreme would be versus the other extreme. The first extreme, which is not the good extreme, is that you get fossil fuels rebounding. They're, they are starting to drop off. They rebound, and they rebound because of low oil prices and bailouts. And this is already happening in some countries. That's the worst case scenario. The best case scenario, our NDCs right now are not sufficient. They're not going to deliver us 1.5. They're not even going to deliver us 2. Then They're just not there. So best case scenario would be you have a strong green stimulus that really drives us towards that 1.5. So you really have two extremes. It's a choice that we're going to have to make. And we really need to be bending it towards the 1.5 as much as we can. So first, what if you look at sustainable recovery in Latin America, what does that look like? What, what, what is the purpose of it? What, what are the goals going to be? Those same things of better health systems, social protection, perhaps using cash transfers, jobs, liquidity are going to be part of it. But you're going to add into that economic growth, and economic connections. So whenever you do an investment, it has knock-on effects into the system, multiplier effects into the system. And you're going to add in the long-term and co-benefits, the long-term impacts and the co-benefits, particularly for Latin America. Those are going to be mitigation, resilience, but also things like dealing with pollution, dealing with biodiversity. Those are the long-term things you need to draw into. The, the, so that's your goal. That's where you're trying to go. The question is, how do you do this? Well, there I, I do think that the Hepburn papers, I think there's a lot of work out there that's already looked at this. There was a lot of assessment from 2008 to 2010 about what worked and what didn't work as well. So what, what kinds of investments would you be looking at? First block would be social resilience investments. Uh, and under that, I would say you have to strengthen the health systems so that they can deal with these kinds of shocks in the future. You also have to strengthen social protection systems. And there are ways of doing that. You can inlay in cash, targeted cash transfer systems into the future so that people get to be part of those systems. 
But the problem in Latin America is that most people are living informally. They're off the grid. They're not going to be connected to that. So you need to fix those kinds of things as well. You also need to sort of enhance the education and retraining systems. South Korea, in their, their recovery plan, has a retraining center, which I think is extraordinary. But that's the kind of innovative thinking that needs to happen. You also need to fix housing challenges. Going back to the cities, the informal neighborhoods, the housing systems, th th there aren't enough houses, and the houses are too expensive, uh, and they're not accessible. So you need to be building housing, but building green housing. You also need to be thinking about the, all the building retrofits that come in. So that's the first block, so in creating social resilience. Second block is really about infrastructure services. But again, this is about providing the services to underserved populations so that they can be more resilient. We already know that things like renewables and electromobility are beginning to be cost-effective. Renewables are cost-effective already, but electromobility is beginning to become cost-effective. This means it's, it's, you're shifting the curve on transformation, which is actually a, a critical shift in, in time. The, um, the, the other big services that we need to think about are water, sanitation, and doing circular economy and how those contribute in themselves to health resilience and also to the resilience of communities and, uh, that are living in underserved areas. The third area, which actually appears a lot in recovery plans, oh my gosh, one minute. <laughs> I was told I had 15 minutes. <laughs> Let me go as quickly as possible then. Okay, the third area would be uh, digital communications. Um, then we need to think about the living world and making that much more resilient as well. And this means looking at food security, supply chains, uh, natural capital, and nature-based solutions and solving that, and then also looking at that urban-rural divide. Uh, to make it last through time, though, we do need to fix a couple of things. One is you need to change policy. Uh, we need to increase uh, the efficiencies of uh, fiscal systems. We need to avoid evasion of taxes. We need to have better spending. We also need to use the tax system to drive incentives forward. We need to decrease expenses. And there, the question of fossil fuel subsidies obviously will come up. Those can be removed, uh, given lower fossil fuel prices right now. We also need to increase income. And there, the EU is actually showing the way forward, things like green taxes, carbon taxes or carbon pricing, and emissions trading. We need to make the financial systems much more, sta much more uh, stable over time and much more resilient, which means increasing uh, use of things like the Task Force on, on Climate Disclosure, managing risks, the financial system, and this is the role of basically the bank, the central banks, the regulators, and supervisors. We also need to be using the capital markets to draw in private investment, uh, which means looking at how you can create green bonds, resilience bonds, but tying it to sustainable use of proceeds. Finally, we need to realize, uh, I think as somebody earlier mentioned, that this all has to be brought together basically with private sector investment. Uh, the public sector is going to be fiscally constrained. It's not going to have the capacity to be able to move forward. So the private sector has to be involved. So that means looking at PPP systems and also this question that was raised earlier by Lara of investment taxonomies and their application. And finally, we need to get the partnerships right to, around this whole system to make it work. And that's what basically SDG 17 is all about. But this means subnational governments, national governments, civil society, private sector, and the development banks who can play a very important role in forging these partnerships. So very quickly, what does this mean for us? It means that, as you can see right now, we're getting more and more engaged in communicating about this future. Uh, NGOs have been doing this for two or three months, talking about sustainable recovery. But now the banks are increasingly getting engaged in those discussions. We're also modifying our own internal uh, circumstances. We're redoing our climate change action plan in line with the recovery. We're also trying to mainstream these ideas within the, the bank itself, the IDB group itself, and move forward the agenda within the group. But this also means the possibility of doing things like policy-based loans for sustainability actions. One of the greatest examples of that is we did one with Costa Rica uh, recently, which has actually been used to deal with COVID. Uh, but the, the actual policy-based loan was about decarbonization. Um, we're also trying to engage increasingly the ministries of finance and planning, who are going to be critical. 
There you can bring in the long-term uh, plans that we've been working on, long-term decarbonization plans, into the discussions on long-term recovery plans. Uh, the, the question also of NDCs, the nationally determined contributions, and how those can be brought in uh, will also be critical. We also are thinking about how to realign all of our internal trust funds and our access to external funds, climate funds, so that they can be used to drive the agenda forward. And trying to align all of our, uh, basically everyone together to actually move forward towards the future. So, summarizing all of that, so the pandemic's obviously a huge risk. There's going to be a massive impact, but it's also a, a very important opportunity. Um, we kind of understand already in generic terms what we need to do, but now the, the focus needs to be working with the city level, working at a country level on actually developing the responses to actions. And here I, I would repeat that we do have several tools already available which were designed for decarbonization or designed for climate action that are perfectly applicable in this context. One is we have a, a, funding, a, a funding mechanism called NDC Invest, which is right now got about 250 initiatives which is focus on supporting planning, supporting the acceleration of pipelines, project pipelines, supporting financing of projects, and innovation. Those are all critical for sustainable recovery. We started off talking about the Getting to Net Zero Emissions Report. Um, please read it. Please take a look at it. It actually describes how you do recovery to some extent. The other report that I mentioned as well is we have another report coming out on jobs and decarbonization, which is also going to be critical, which is going to show basically that decarbonization brings you jobs, uh, which I think is also critical to this discussion as a whole. And finally, I just wanted to end on saying, look, everyone needs to work together to be able to move this forward. It's a huge challenge. It's not going to happen unless we're all working towards the same vision. Uh, and it's not going to happen if we all don't join forces uh, with funds from different areas, but also with actions supported on the ground from different groups of people. Uh, but I do think it's achievable. I think we can actually move this forward and we can go to that option of the 1.5 degrees that I mentioned right at the beginning. I think that that's possible and doable and together we can get it done. Thank you. Uh, many thanks, Graham. Uh very a lot of information really important so uh, please all the participants read those reports for favor revisen esos reportes del pid um, y bueno muchas gracias por por toda la información Ahora le quiero dar la oportunidad, bueno, quiero recordar a los participantes que las preguntas las estamos llevando en el Q&A, eh, donde nuestros panelistas pueden tener la oportunidad de contestar y como siempre el, el tiempo apremia un poco, eh, pasamos rápidamente a darle la palabra a Ismo Ulvila. Ismo es experto de la Dirección General de, Ac de Acción por el, el Clima de la Comisión Europea. Eh, Ismo, muchas gracias por estar con nosotros hoy. Eh, sí, allá nos hablaban antes sobre el Pacto Verde Europeo, el European Green Deal. ¿Nos podrías compartir también un poco sobre los mensajes o el plan de acción eh, y cómo eso influye para la región latinoamericana y caribeña? Gracias, adelante. Gracias y uh, mis disculpas uh, por las... Uh, por los asuntos técnicos que tenía eh, para reunirme en, esa, en ese panel, eh, por fin son resueltos. Eh, les saludo desde Helsinki, eh, que se encuentra en la latitud 60, o sea, más o menos en la misma altura como Anchorage en Alaska. Y cuando miro eh, fuera de la ventana, veo aquí el cambio climático en plena acción. Hemos tenido el mes de junio lo más caliente desde 1939. Es eh, absurdo, es eh, mucho más caliente que en, eh, en el Mediterráneo Europeo en ese momento. Y hace una semana en Siberia, en Rusia, había más o menos 35 grados. ¿eh? Eh, esa es una evidencia, una anécdota, como se ve que las zonas nórdicas se están calentando, de hecho, dos veces más rápidamente que, que muchas otras zonas en el mundo. Eh, mira, yo creo que me queda muy poco para decir después de, después de las intervenciones que he escuchado porque estoy totalmente de acuerdo con todo lo que se ha dicho y de hecho yo casi, casi hubiese podido escribir los, los, los mismos comentarios yo mismo. 
pero tal, tal vez algunos puntos. Eh, voy a tocar tres puntos. Eh. Eh, en primer lugar, el, 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 el contexto europeo. En, en segundo lugar, un poco en el contexto latinoamericano. Y en, 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 en lo último, eh, voy a hacer una referencia a las negociaciones internacionales eh, en el marco del convenio de, convenio de las Naciones Unidas para el Cambio Climático. En, <coughs> perdón. En, 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 en la Unión Europea, eh, lo que nosotros hicimos, la Comisión hizo una propuesta eh, en el otoño eh, del año pasado para cómo aún subir nuestra ambición como la Unión Europea y cómo poner el, 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 el famoso Pacto Verde al centro de la política de la, de la Comisión Europea, que también comenzó, arrancó sus, uh, con sus funciones en el, en el otoño del año pasado. Tenemos mandato de cinco años. ¿eh? Y eh, es, es, es impresionante cuando se mira, eh, por un lado, eh, la demanda eh, pública que tenemos, eh, más o menos 80% de los ciudadanos en los países de la Unión Europea quieren más acción climática, es más o menos el mismo tipo de dato de lo que Graham eh, acabo de mencionar sobre la situación en México, en Brasil, en las economías emergentes en eh, América Latina. O sea, estamos respondiendo a esa, esa demanda eh, pública, por un lado. Por otro lado, eh, también lo que se puede constatar es que eh, es la primera vez que el énfasis, que el, el, el corazón duro de, de la agenda de la Comisión está, está en, eh, en el cambio climático. Y por eso nosotros, por eso nosotros hicimos esta propuesta que había previsto de producir 40, 42, creo que eran, propuestas para mejorar la acción climática a nivel europeo al llegar al verano 2021. O sea, un, una tremenda tarea. Y luego llegó el crisis COVID y eh, hemos ahora reescrito, eh, eh, reformulado la propuesta y hemos hecho hace unas semanas la nueva propuesta que se llama la, generación, eh, la próxima generación sobre cómo vamos a, vamos a mejorar y cómo vamos a rescatar eh, lo mejor para, y preparar lo mejor para la próxima generación. Entonces, ¿qué, ¿qué quiere decir todo eso? Por un lado, nosotros opinamos que el paquete que hemos propuesto es lo más ambicioso de las economías emergentes o, o de las mayores economías que hay en el mundo. Y eso también ha sido confirmado cuando se mira diferentes independientes eh, análisis. Por ejemplo, hay uno por Vivid Economics, donde se da como cierto tipo de pautas eh, a, a los sectores que se está considerando. Y estamos orgullosos en ese sentido y creemos que hemos, eh, hemos tocado, hemos hecho un producto que es eh, más o menos equilibrado y, eh, y que nos lleva adelante con nuestra agenda. Estamos subiendo la ambición en Europa eh, desde, desde la meta de, de menos 40% eh, hacia menos 50-55% al llegar a, a, a 2030. Y luego estamos, eh, estamos en el camino eh, nuestro norte hacia, hacia una neutralidad climática al llegar a 2050. Eso es un trabajo que ya comenzó en Europa desde hace 20 años. ¿eh? Y de hecho también eh, quiero, quiero también subrayar eh, la importancia que eso ha tenido para nuestra economía. Desde 1990 nosotros hemos, eh, hemos eh, bajado nuestras emisiones por casi 25%. Mientras que eh, la economía de la Unión Europea ha aumentado por, supongo que es casi 60%. ¿eh? Entonces, hemos hecho el famoso decoupling, el, el des, descoplaje o como, como se llama, no sé. Eh, eso eso, eso, eso por, en, en cuanto se piensa de, de, de la acción económica y de, del resultado económico eh, de toda esa acción, nosotros hemos comprobado que eso es un buen negocio. Eh, cuando se mira a los millones de empleos generados, el, el, el famoso cambio energético en Alemania, aunque ha recibido muchísimo, muchísima crítica también, 
también ha producido millones de empleos, de lo que se llama los empleos verdes, ¿eh? Eh, a través de nuestro sistema de, de régimen de comercio de carbono, o sea, eu -ETS, tenemos evidencia de que cómo eso ha podido dar un empuje a las empresas europeas de mejorar su eficiencia, de meter más fondos a pesquisa y a desarrollo de sus eh, procesos manufactureros. Y, eh, y también hemos podido comprobar que el, el, el costo de carbono en la Unión Europea no ha sido dañino a la competitividad, con, competitividad de, la, de la industria europea. Entonces, todo eso va mano a mano y ha sido uh, hasta ahora, y nosotros estamos uh, completamente convencidos que cuando seguimos con esa política, es, uh, es política sostenible, competitiva, y por un lado también, que, por otro lado, que, que genera empleo y prosperidad. Tenemos también otros mecanismos de protección y para también garantizar la, el tema de inclusión. Tenemos el famoso Just Transition Fund, etc. O sea, todo eso, también los asuntos sociales están parte del paquete. Um, ahora, um, cuando, cuando se mira todo eso en el contexto global y sobre todo en el contexto latinoamericano, uh, yo creo que y Horst, Horst seguro va a tocar esos temas más en detalle cuando habla de euroclima, yo creo que hay, hay bastante convergencia en lo que nosotros hemos hecho y de qué se podría hacer también en América Latina. Primero de primero, el, la visión de largo plazo, cuando se está desarrollando el marco regulatorio, cuando se envía ese signal a los inversionistas, que qué tipo de metas, qué tipo de regulación vamos a tener entre ahora y 10 años, 30 o 50 años, tomando en cuenta que las inversiones, las inversiones privadas que se deciden hoy, estarán aún con nosotros en 2050, cuando hablamos de ciclo de inversión de 30 o 50 años. ¿eh? Entonces, el tema de, de previsión, el tema de, 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 de confianza al regulador, según nuestra experiencia, es primordial. ¿eh? No hay que olvidar que si queremos realmente atacar y cumplir con las metas eh, de París de 2 grados o 1.5 grados, casi más o menos 95% de, de, de todo ese dinero, de todos esos recursos, tienen que venir de los inversionistas privados, ¿eh? con fines de lucro, pero con el empuje del, del regulador Uh, y de, 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 con la participación de la sociedad civil que sean parte de, de, de ese cambio, como ya alguien de los otros panelistas uh, mencionó. Uh, también yo creo que en el contexto latinoamericano es, es, es muy importante el, um, la circunstancia que tenemos un continente altamente urbanizado, donde más o menos 80 más que 80% de la ciudadanía vive en ciudades. Um, esa transición verde, nosotros hemos también comprobado en Europa, brinda beneficios secundarios. ¿eh? Brinda los beneficios en eh, cuanto a la calidad de aire. Tenemos en Europa aún eh, 400.000 personas, eh, 400 personas eh, en la Unión Europea que cada año mueren por uh, los problemas respiratorios. Es un componente de análisis que hemos incluido en nuestra transición de que cómo esa transición hacia verde, hacia, hacia bajo carbono, va a también reducir el impacto al salud. ¿eh? Y tenemos también el, el componente de biodiversidad en, 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 en nuestro pacto. Uh, todos esos son áreas que, que se aplican también en América Latina. Uh, yo estoy personalmente convencido que más o menos entre 10 años a partir de ahora, en todos los países uh, del mundo, en las economías emergentes o en, uh, en las mayores economías sobre todo, habrá algún tipo de precio al carbono. Y eh, hacia, hacia esa dirección eh, también van muchos, muchos tratados, eh, si no lo he notado, gracias. Eh, 
y en ese sentido también van muchos tratados sobre el libre comercio. Entonces, eh, comenzando y, e implementando ese, este, esta transición con la meta hacia 10, hacia 20, hacia, hacia 30 años, es, eh, es, eh, es algo que nosotros hemos estado haciendo desde hace 20 años. Eh, y eso es mi, mi punto principal. Eh. Um, un, un otro punto más en este, eh, eh, el famoso Carbon Lock-in. Eh. Eh, creo que fue alguien de los panelistas quien lo hizo, quien, quien lo constató también mucho mejor que yo puedo, pero lo importante con el estímulo es de, de poner esas, eh, esas condiciones para, para que el estímulo se, se invierta de la manera eh, sostenible y que pueda contribuir al, al proceso de, de la mejora eh, de las NDCs que ahora justo en ese momento se está haciendo. Eh, mi último punto muy rápidamente porque también estoy muy, eh, muy metido en el proceso de las negociaciones eh, bajo las Naciones Unidas y soy, eh, soy también el presidente del Comité Permanente de Finanzas de la Convención Climática. Um, aunque parece que no mucho está pasando en ese momento en, en las negociaciones, eh, hay que utilizar ese tiempo que tenemos bien. Por un lado, intentar eh, resolver eh, ciertos puntos de diferencia de opinión que tenemos entre las mayores partes. Y por otro lado, también ver cómo podemos avanzar en esos, en, en esos otros ejes que están fuera del proceso de marco de las Naciones Unidas. Si algo esa crisis ha mostrado, ha mostrado también la importancia de todas esas iniciativas que, que están allá, que sean plataformas de finanzas sostenibles, que sea la coalición de, de, de los bancos multilaterales, que, que sea, que ese trabajo tiene que avanzar y tal vez a través de de esas plataformas también podemos brindar insumos al, al proceso formal bajo las, eh, bajo las Naciones Unidas. Eh. Um, y por lo último, um, cuando, cuando se mira eh, los, eh, los desafíos que tenemos para COP26, el tema de finanzas obviamente va a ser uno, pero sobre todo eh, tenemos que estar trabajando para la ambición. Uh, ambición de todas sus partes, de ver que cómo podemos uh, subir nuestra ambición. Y allá, cuando se mira la Unión Europea y América Latina y el Caribe, juntos somos casi una tercera parte de los miembros, casi una tercera parte de las partes uh, a, a la Convención Climática. Y allá juntos podríamos también tener bastante peso político de, de, de llevar uh, uh, agenda progresiva. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias. Eh, nuevamente estamos teniendo una síntesis de información de suma importancia eh, para la región en cuanto al contexto también que vivimos. Eh, estamos un poco con el tiempo apretado, eh, y le, pero siempre eh, tenemos la oportunidad de escuchar todavía. Tenemos dos panelistas, eh, les pedimos, tenemos 10, 12 minutos máximos para jugar un poquito con el tiempo, eh, pero ahora me da gusto presentar a Horst Pilger. Horst es el jefe de sector de la Dirección General para el Desarrollo y Cooperación de la Comisión Europea y él también nos compartirá más detalles sobre las perspectivas de la cooperación en cuanto a cambio climático y otros temas entre la Unión Europea y América Latina y el Caribe. Muchas gracias, buenas tardes. Hola, buenos días a todos y a todos. Uh, can you hear me okay? Because I also had some connection problems. The good news is a lot of what I wanted to say has already been said, so I will try to be brief. I've been invited to talk a bit about the Euroclima program, so we try to approach it from that angle to see a little bit what we are doing, what we have been doing, and how we can now make this work also in the, in the light of, of COVID. Um, some of you may know some of this, um, so that's the risk here. But um, in a nutshell, Euroclima is the program with which the European Union has been trying dialogue with the Latin American region for actually 10 years. We have 10 years of Euroclima that makes it actually one of the older climate change programs in, in this uh, fast-changing world. 
Um, and um, we are doing this uh, in uh, working very closely with the uh, 18 countries represented by national focal points. And we have been trying very much to adapt the program to what the countries want and what they need. And obviously, in the run-up to the Paris Agreement, these were different things than they are now. And COVID will change this again. But I wanted to emphasize that very much um, the way we're doing this is to say we are trying to listen and adapt the program accordingly. And this demand-driven nature of, of Euroclima uh, has been a, a, a very important factor. So we started very small. I mean, the, to give you just one figure, the, the program budget for the first seven years was about 16 million euro. That's one six. And now we're having roughly for the last three years, 140. I think that's a reflection both to the uh, fact that uh, somehow the program is perceived to work, but also obviously to this topic having gained a lot in importance in recent years. And basically, um, at the moment, uh, Euroclim is basically working with two main strands of operation. One is when we got the budget increase, we asked the Latin American countries how to use it. And they really said, we want to have actions on the ground. We want us to show projects, what can be done that uh, has a real impact. So based on this, we organized uh, calls for proposals in six sectors. I don't want to mention them all in the interest of time, but I mean, you can imagine energy, transport, uh, mobility, and so on. And uh, in these sectors, we're now implementing a total of 60 projects um, that will go on for another two, three years. In addition, and um, at the heart of Euroclima is also what we call the climate dialogues. We try to uh, dialogue with countries to sit on the table and see how we can assist either in the formulation of climate policies or in the implementation of climate policies. In line with what others have said, obviously we believe very strongly that the access to finance is of crucial importance because we have compared to the real needs out there, only a tiny fraction of money. But if we can use it in a way to unlock finances and to assist countries in unlocking finances, then we have probably done a good service to the European taxpayer. And since the, since the Katowice COP uh, in 2018, we also um, have strongly focused the, 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 the program more strongly on the assistance in the implementation and monitoring of NDCs. That is obviously not the topic that we did 10 years ago, but this is the third axis where we are now um, very strongly active in. So, this is a little bit uh, how it has been working. Uh, what is very important is to understand that we have been trying to work with EU member state agencies. So the idea is that we say we don't we come to this table not only as the European Commission, but with all those agencies, we made a little call. Is we asked all the member states who wanted to come on board, and we have now two Spanish, two French, and a GIZ from Germany member state agencies that try to by sitting around the Euro climate table also trying to improve their own synergies and their own working together in, in, in Latin America in, in this area. Uh, in addition, we are also working with the UN Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean, CEPAL, you all know them, as well as with UN Environment, because we believe these two also have a very important role in the region, also to try to bring information to decision makers, to say, okay, how do countries compare, how do they perform, what are lessons learned, what can be um, interesting uh, knowledge transferred from, from, from one to the other. So I could give you now a lot of examples about what we're doing specifically in, in what countries, but um, maybe that's not so relevant. Maybe it should look a bit on how we are now positioned ourselves with regards to the COVID pandemic. Well, since we are operating demand-driven, we haven't had a lot of activities yet, but we have started analyzing uh, the issue. And um, there's a few sort of um, elements that I think are worth uh, um, presenting of how we believe the situation is evolving. First of all, we believe there's a risk now in a, a real reduction in climate spending. Because of a uh, very dire situation with regards to public finances and with regards to the loss uh, of, of revenues, of taxes and so on, there's a risk there will be less money made available. And this will obviously also risk that uh, maybe the indices won't be revised in the same time frame as we had hoped for or won't be re revised in such an ambitious fashion as we all had hoped for. And so basically, um, there are several reasons for this. I mean, COVID makes it more difficult for uh, gathering the correct data. COVID makes it more diff difficult for simply people getting together to take decisions. Um, but also uh, the, the whole communication becomes more difficult. 
So um, what are the answers for a program like Euroclima? In our view, we must be um, doing everything in our power to ensure that whenever a country launches an economic stim stimulus package, that this is NDC-minded and includes a, a smart uh, uh, thinking with regards to climate. We must also um, uh, point out in all our dialogues, and this is why this type of event today is useful, that there's a huge chance in this uh, uh, green growth agenda to be promoted in, in our partner countries. And um, uh, obviously, this must include the mobilization of finance from both public and private sectors, as we also heard already Ismo say. And um, we, perhaps we should ask ourselves in Euroclima whether this is also the right moment to strengthen technical assistance not only traditionally in the areas of cooperating with ministries of um, uh, uh, sorry, environment, but also to include more strongly ministries of finance, ministries of planning in, in this sort of cooperation and in this sort of dialogue we have. And also we believe this is another opportunity to also try to work towards strengthening the dialogue within the region, because now that countries start uh, preparing their own response packages, this is another very good opportunity to uh, compare and exchange and see if there are lessons to be drawn that, that can be a cross-fertilization of, of ideas. So um, we are already with some of our projects having uh, some projects covering public health uh, uh, aspects, as you can imagine, if you talk about urban mobility or, or agriculture and so on. But we are um, also um, now, for example, sitting around the table with the NDC partnership already. They have started uh, um, an initiative to provide technical advisors to ministries of finance. And this very specifically are engaging with them. For example, Bolivia, Ecuador and Peru are the first candidate countries where, where we are offering our assistance. But there's a number of other countries where this is also considered. This is not an initiative of Euroclima, but we believe this is an area where we can, in those countries, where we have added value, come in in a useful way. And um, so in two weeks from now, for example, we will sit together with our national focal points, which in Euroclima is mostly ministries of environment, but we have to push that to include more strongly also ministries of finance, but to sit together with them and to offer again to say, look, here we are, we have our way forward with regards to the program, but we are willing to dialogue and see how we can adapt the program responses to your post-COVID needs, because the world is evolving and maybe their needs are evolving and we are relatively flexible to adapt to this. So the way the program is operating because of these seven agencies and the different weaknesses and strengths gives us an opportunity to, to come in and perhaps relatively quickly offer assistance if there is is a demand that falls within uh, the, the objectives of, of our program. Um, what I have mentioned at the beginning is we're doing this in the 18 Latin American countries, but this is also an event of the Luck Foundation. So the Caribbean is a bit of a problem because so far, for historic reasons, we have had different funding pots, you know that all. In the European Union, the Caribbean is, treated, uh, is, is getting uh, assistance from the European Development Fund whereas the Latin American region from the uh, cooperation instrument. Now with the new commission proposal in the seven years ahead, there's a real chance now to overcome this division. And this is uh, where we have been as Euroclima trying to work towards a more flexible approach. We believe it could, for example, in some areas make a lot of sense to have all 33 countries around the table. I mentioned before the implementation of NDCs and the monitoring of the implementation. This is the monitoring has many technical aspects, which would be perfectly valid for covering them in a program with all countries. On the other hand, we also know that uh, it doesn't make sense to have uh, a discussion with mitigation in the same way uh, with Brazil on the one hand and with a country in the Caribbean. So we must obviously assist the Caribbean countries much more in the areas of resilience, of adaptation, and we must find smart solutions where we have in the future perhaps special packages for special needs. Amazon is one of these challenges, which also covers several countries in South America. And so we, we, we have to try to develop the program to become more responsive in, in that sense. But crucial is, is the dialogue. Crucial is that we from Euroclima do not want to impose. We try to offer some solutions that also come from the wisdom of our member state agencies, be it from experiences gained within Europe, but also be it from experiences that these agencies have gained through work elsewhere in the region. We're trying to bring this together. And um, there's never enough dialogue in, in this context, but we're trying to make a, a small contribution uh, to this uh, effect. 
So, and I, I will uh, already conclude here. So to say, um, implementing the, the Green Deal and the COVID response will be a huge challenge in Latin America. I don't want to repeat because so many others have already outlined that the challenges and the many links and hooks and, and, and connections that are linked to this. But I believe there is a, a strong commitment from the EU to continue working with uh, both Latin America and the Caribbean, perhaps stronger together as one region than has been the case so far. And uh, there will be new financing instruments coming into this. So there will be a traditional continuation of programs such as Eurotema, but there will perhaps be more of the uh, more innovative instruments such as blending. We have had that for a number of years, but also the guarantees. We haven't talked a lot about this one. I think there's a good opportunity there as well because this can enhance the private sector to make more strongly in investments. And um, we will continue focus in Euroclima on the uh, improvement of climate policies and the implementation. And obviously, we have in doing that, be mindful of the new challenges that COVID brought about. But fundamentally, we strongly believe this is a new dimension, but hasn't changed the ultimate objectives. The ultimate objectives is we must increase uh, ambition and we must ensure that we work with those partner countries that are willing to, to go along with us. I leave it at this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Horst. Uh, very useful insights. And I think also with a touch of positives in terms of improving also the intra uh, dialogue within the region, no? which is, I also agree with you, really important. And this is a great opportunity in order uh, to improve uh, the communication and the work with, uh, together within the Latin American countries and with the support of the Euroclima program. Thank you very much. And now um, uh, the reports, and but we all already knew also that we have in the Latin American and Caribbean region uh, some special regions that are more exposed or more vulnerable to climate change. And recently the ECLAC or CEPAL just mentioned or also included an entire chapter uh, for the Caribbean and Central America as the most vulnerable regions uh, in the region. And today we can have some perspective from the Caribbean. Uh, we have uh, Colin June, who is the executive director of the Caribbean Community Climate Change Center, 5C, if I am not wrong. <laughs> and he will give us some perspective from the Caribbean and uh, how do you in the region fight or are, are thinking to 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 face climate change now ahead or uh, considering the COVID nineteen crisis? How what what does it give or how we, what can we learn? Uh, thank you, Tania. Um, to start, I want to express my. Sincere appreciation to Paola Amade and the EU LAC Foundation for extending an invitation to participate in this very, very timely webinar uh, to discuss climate change and COVID-19, arguably the two most important global issues facing all of humanity at the same time. I've been asked today to share our perspective on the double challenges in managing the pandemic and climate change response in the region. And so I would like to share three points to elucidate both the scale and the complexity of responding to these global challenges. Of course, in the Caribbean, because of our size and our geography and small populations, uh, responding to dual uh, uh, disasters as great as COVID-19 and as climate change really uh, poses some unique challenges uh, to the region. The first point I want to make uh, is that the region's disaster preparedness plans and response mechanisms can easily be overwhelmed by the scale and severity of COVID-19 and the ongoing climate change impacts. Climate change and COVID-19 share many similarities, and we've discuss discussed some of these um, already, and some of the panelists has, uh, have, have raised them. They are both physical shocks that are unleashing unprecedented and devastating impacts on lives and livelihoods and the economy of Caribbean nations. Both are taxing and stressing the region's capacity to adequately and effectively respond. 
and both are exposing the many social and economic vulnerabilities that exist within our countries. And of course, both are regressive in that they're having a disproportionate impact on the most vulnerable populations within our societies. And these points have been raised uh, by, as I said, uh, many of the panelists before. So responding to these dual impacts clearly will test the limits of our preparedness and disaster response systems. While the region has amassed over the years considerable experience and capacity in managing and responding to climate shocks, born out of, uh, you would say, um, sheer necessity, there is little experience in dealing with a global pandemic that disrupts national, regional, and global systems and supply chains all at once. Of course, we all know that we are in one month into the 2020 hurricane season that according to NOAA will be above normal with possibly six to 10 hurricanes, three of which may become major ones. COVID arrived at a time when the region is most vulnerable. Countries must now grapple with incorporating COVID-19 protocols as part of their hurricane preparedness plans. The shelter management logistics must consider social distancing and appropriate hygiene including the wearing of masks and the need to sanitize. The restoration of electricity and other public utilities that normally requires a significant help after hurricane must now factor in COVID-19 protocols. The procurement of emergency supplies and equipment was planned for supply chain disruptions that will impact the availability and costs, notwithstanding the foreign exchange crunch many countries find themselves in. So coupled with the ongoing climate shocks, such as droughts and floods, that are already threatening the food and, and water security and damaging significant amount of our infrastructure, it is easy to see how the scale of the response required can easily overwhelm our disaster management systems. The second point I want to raise is that responding to climate change and COVID-19 will exceed the fiscal space available in most of our countries in the region. And so it was good to understand that the, both the EU and the IDB and the IMF and the multilateral organizations have been stepping up uh, their ambition in this space. Because even in a non-pandemic year, the Caribbean is significantly impacted by natural disasters. Many of us in this forum know this quite well, in Belize, for example, in uh, climate-related disasters, cause losses equivalent to 7% of GDP annually. Hurricane Maria devastated Dominica, caused damages of over 227% of their GDP in 2017. Only two years after tropical storm Erica caused damages of over 90% of GDP. Hurricane Dorian in the Bahamas in 2019 caused losses of up to 3.4 billion. And so you get the sense that climate change already is creating a havoc in the region. And uh, we have not essentially recovered uh, from the 2008-2010 financial crisis, um, partly because of the recurrent uh, climate change losses that are occurring. So COVID-19 now in only three months has brought the economies of the region to a halt with dire consequences at the worst possible time of the year. Government revenues have plummeted as countries closed borders and declared national shutdowns, bringing tourism and other economic activities to a standstill. Governments have been forced to undertake massive spending and reallocate national budgets to provide lives and livelihoods and strengthen health systems to deal with COVID-19. National efforts are being supplemented with emergency loans and reallocation of funds uh, some even earmark for climate resilient growth to provide social protect protection coverage. The end result is that public finances in the region are stretched far too thin. Fiscal space has disappeared, debt to GDP ratio is worsening further, curtailing the access to financing. In short, there is little resources available to deal with the ongoing climate shocks. Our countries need urgent financial help inclusive of debt restructuring and relief, and access to concessional financing, irrespective of their middle income status or per capita GDP metrics. 
The Prime Minister of Barbados and the Chair of CARICOM recently called for a restructuring of debt or debt moratorium in the region, so as to prevent what she called a disorderly unraveling that will create crises within our countries and the global financial system. Without such a coordinated international response, then, the region's ability uh, to respond to these challenges will be undermined with serious implications for the people and the region's attainment of our sustainable development goals. The third point is that despite all of this, the Caribbean region, our countries are determined to keep the drumbeat of climate ambition alive. So despite the disappointing outcomes of COP25 in terms of ambition and the postponement of COP26, our countries remain resolute in leading the way in climate action, even during the pandemic. For us, climate change is always an existential issue. The ambition and innovation of the Caribbean was recently demonstrated by the government of Belize as chair of the small island development states, AOSIS, when it convened, even during the pandemic, the virtual Placencia Ambition Forum that brought together over a thousand participants including prime ministers, ministers, UN agencies, donors, and partners. The forum succeeded in maintaining the momentum required for climate action. And while the pandemic is causing some delays in the development of new, updated, and ambitious nationally determined contributions due to quarantine measures and restrictions of mo on movement, our member states are determined to submit their revised NDCs in 2020. Indeed, the government of Suriname has already led the way in this regard. To be successful, however, urgent additional support is needed to support NDCs and their implementation plans, along the lines of what Horace just recently mentioned. Significant funding from the global climate finance modalities will be needed to turn commitments into action. So both climate change and COVID-19 have fundamentally changed the way of life for the whole world, especially here in the Caribbean. However, there are opportunities even in crises. And so the Clarion call for financing to implement NDCs and to respond to COVID-19, however, must be met with the political will and commitment to build better and recover with resilience in mind. The five Cs can continue to play its role in providing climate data to improve evidence-based decision-making and improve resilience. International finance flows from the multilateral financial institutions should fund NDC implementation, many of which include activities to build the region's social and environmental resilience, not just to climate change, but also to other physical shocks. To conclude then, uh, managing the response to the dual challenges of climate change and COVID-19 has no recent historical precedents, as, as you've heard. As such, there is no management blueprint per se. However, what we do know is that there is an undeniable opportunity for the leaders of the region to seize the moment and muster the same kind of political will and Caribbean leadership that continues to serve as a beacon during the management of the pandemic to implement systemic changes that will make the region and its people more resilient to climate change and future pandemics. As a region that is so small, uh, that has many challenges, even before the pandemic, uh, this uh, situation and the ongoing onslaught of climate change impacts require a rethink and a recommitment by all of us, by the public sector, the private sector, civil society, and organizations uh, on all over the world to channel their resources and their resiliency uh, into helping everyone, especially uh, those of us here in the Caribbean. And with that, in the interest of time, I would, I would say thank you. Many, many thanks, Colin, um, because uh, it gave us some, your presentation gave us some perspective from what the reality that we are facing. So how urgent action is and how disruptive the crisis, the crisis of the COVID-19. Um, 
is presented or is for the region of the Caribbean that, as you mentioned before, is just a in the start of the hurricane season that we all know is uh, also have, uh, needs a lot of preparation every year. Uh, we want to thank all of you. Uh, it has been uh, really interesting and enriching to hear uh, the different perspectives, the messages and the need to act and the, and the need to act in a way that we are building a resilient society. Uh, we have uh, only one question that we would like to pose and uh, any of you want to answer and is related uh, and, um, to how the Latin American countries can enhance their ambition and enhance their action when actually they were not having the tools and resources and the means to implement the already indices that were in place. So not even talking about post-COVID, but uh, pre-COVID, uh, what uh, would you uh, think that will be the way that make the Latin American countries uh, go um, more ambitious in their climate action and in a climate resilient way? If any of you want to briefly answer And that was a question from one of our participants that was posed during the webinar and was not answered. It's open, Horst. Yeah. Okay, I think always it's very interesting if one can work with sort of um, information. So if, if for example, um, uh, we can contribute to making it transparent in a way how good or bad the countries are doing in the NDC implementation. If we were able to publish a report where we have, for example, not even all, but a few countries compared to each other, it could be extremely powerful tool in the public. I mean, I think of the PISA studies in Europe, where all of a sudden you see how good or bad uh, uh, your education system is performing compared to other OECD countries. And that all of a sudden creates a very interesting, uh, powerful tool. So if we could, for example, encourage a few countries to say, why don't you work with us and say, we would jointly analyze every year the progress you're making in NDC implementation uh, and, and try to come up with some sort of uh, um, annual reporting and, and try to make this uh, uh, in a way uh, understandable and readable for the public. I think that could be a very interesting way. We know that some countries in the region have very good and very ambitious politics and policies, so we could try to 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 you know showcase this. And and um, we already heard uh, earlier today that some uh, um, um, how to say there are some surveys that show how big the support is for for green recovery in Latin America. So I think there's quite an appetite in the in the, in the population to to buy into this. But obviously, people need that information in a digestible way, and so I think there's a useful contribution to be made. Um, perhaps if I step, can, can I step in after host? Uh, yeah, briefly we want... Yeah, uh, yeah thanks. Yeah. I think there are good examples in the region. Uh, I mean, first and foremost, of course, you have the ILAC countries that, uh, that um, have the documented uh, experiences on how this transition has been put underway. Um, and I think in many regards, uh, what many, many of those, uh, those countries are doing that are part of ILAC, I think, uh, is, is pretty much coherent with what we do in Europe. So, um, I guess what I want to say is that there's no silver bullet to this. Uh, there's no short term solution. Uh, it's, it's a challenge for generations, uh, for decades. Uh, it's a challenge of uh, long-term planning, uh, of good governance, of uh, successive governments uh, buying into the agenda of the previous ones uh, without firing the civil servants who have been doing and, uh, and involved and who have all the institutional memory. Um, so it's, <laughs> it's continuity of regulation, uh, sending the signals, creating the confidence, uh, good governance principles. Uh, establishing targets, uh, uh, sticking to those targets, um, and then working together and not against uh, the so civil society with the private sector, 
uh, academia and so on and so forth. Uh, stakeholder consultations uh, in how to improve the process uh, in those countries that are not that are federal countries, not forgetting uh, the state or city level. Uh, that is often quite important. And uh, having this as a societal transformation project, uh, that's, in, that's in one line. And accepting that, uh, that uh, I'm not going to be benefiting of this uh, personally, but my, my children will be, I hope. Thanks. A long-term vision. Uh, yeah. Graham, you wanted to... Yeah, quickly, I think, I think it is a major risk, and I, I think it's probably one of the biggest risks that there is out there. People's minds and their money are, are elsewhere right now. However, I, I think that the EU, when they presented their, their model for recovery, also talked about financial systems. It actually put the basis in to say, how are you going to pay for this? Uh, it could probably do a little bit more in terms of how you're going to pay for it in the long term, like how you're going to fund it. But it talked about how you're going to finance it. And I think that there is space there for discussion with the private sector. I think the ideas of putting sustainability into PPP arrangements, which is something that we've been doing in Jamaica, is one way forward. And, and using PPPs to actually drive forward recovery uh, and therefore ambition. I think bonds, green bonds, uh, resilience bonds, COVID bonds, it's a way of raising the money, provided you make sure that the use of proceeds is green, basically, uh, or, or social in some senses. We did one, we supported a bond in Chile, which had a hu huge, a green bond, which has been massive. I, I think its first announcement was $1.4 billion for sustainable infrastructure, for example. Um, we are also discussing, for example, how you get the private sector engaged in nature-based solutions, how they can actually drive forward nature-based solutions. And I think that's another entry point. You can also look at the fiscal constraints themselves and start to manage This is much more difficult, <laughs> especially right now. It's not, not the easiest thing to do in the world. But again, the EU talks about carbon pricing, talks about taxation, green taxes. It talks about uh, removing fossil fuel subsidies. Uh, if, uh, the numbers are around 40 billion in Latin America alone for fossil fuel subsidies. So you can either increase uh, income or you can reduce the expenditure side of things. Uh, you can also use things like emissions trading, which has come back onto the table in the EU. And uh, in an earlier discussion I had today, people were also talking about using taxation for as an incentive structure to incentivize solar panels as opposed to fossil fuels. Um, and ultimately, I think also the governments, as part of their planning, can incorporate changes to financial systems at the end of the day. Regulators can ask for climate disclosure in systems and, and insist that it's there. I mean, yes, it might get some resistance, but it's not a high cost change for the governments. It's going to be a cost for somebody else. Um, but I think that there's a lot of ideas out there. I think there are some, I mean, I think it is critical because you can talk about all you want about, well, we're going to do this, 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 and this. But if you can't finance it and you can't fund it in the long term, you might as well be, be just talking. Uh, so that would be my answer to that question. Gracias, eh, Graham. Y con eso eh, damos por cerrado la participación de nuestro excelente panel. Ha sido enriquecedor. Eh, y creo que el mensaje principal que nos queda, esta también es una oportunidad, esta crisis nos está dando las pautas para sentar acción ambiciosa eh, y resiliente para nosotros y para las generaciones que nos siguen. ¿no? Hay muchos mucho retos, pero podemos ser, tomar el reto y sacarlo adelante. Latinoamérica tiene, es una región con muchas inequidades, con muchos problemas, pero también es una región de ideas, es una región de alegría y de energía. Y hay que quedarnos con esa parte también para la acción climática ambiciosa. Hemos visto ejemplos de cooperación en acción y una de esas... Eh, ejemplo de cooperación es la fundación misma a la que le agradezco la oportunidad de este, de, de este webinar de moderarlo y de escuchar eh, a nuestros panelistas y de compartir y con eso me despido les doy los pasos buenos días y buenas tardes desde Hamburgo y le paso la palabra a Paola Bueno eh, antes de empezar con mis conclusiones, verán que ha aparecido en su pantalla una encuesta 
le pediríamos a los participantes de contestar porque eso nos ayuda a eh, entender eh, el nivel de satisfacción y la utilidad de este tipo de ejercicio. Evidentemente es una sola pregunta en este caso, por eso también le invitamos, si tiene más comentario, a enviárnoslos directamente a la Fundación para poderlo tener en cuenta a futuro. You see on your screen a poll with a question. We ask you uh, to reply on the usefulness of this webinar. If you have more comments for the foundation, please uh, don't hesitate to, to send uh, your comments uh, to us uh, so we can take them uh, into account uh, uh, for the future. Como hemos, en la buena parte de ese ejercicio, hemos hablado en inglés, paso ahora al español. Le doy muchísimas gracias a la moderadora, Tania Guillén, así como a la copresidencia, al embajador Escanero, a la señora Guintas Dorfer y a la representante del, eh, de la Comisión Europea, Felice Zaqueo, que habló en nombre de la Dirección General de Desarrollo. Le agradezco a todos los panelistas, Laura Lázaro Tusa del Instituto El Cano, Horst Pilger e Ismo Ulvila de la Comisión Europea, respectivamente de la DG Desarrollo y Cooperación y de la Dirección General de Acción para el Clima, Graham Watkins de la División de Cambio Climático del BID y Colin Yang, secretario ejecutivo de la Organización de Clima del Caribe. Eh, con lo cual, por supuesto, estamos en este momento en proceso de eh, firmar, ojalá en lo próxima, la próxima semana, un acuerdo de cooperación. Esto porque... Eh, reconocemos como fundación toda la importancia de eh, este tema y de este tema sobre todo en una región vulnerable como el Caribe. I was saying that uh, currently we are preparing an agreement with uh, the uh, 5C, the uh, Climate Change uh, Organization of the Caribbean Community, uh, because as uh, foundation we recognize the importance of uh, this subject especially in the Caribbean. Uh, como le decía esta es uh, mi, uh, el último webinario al cual participo como directora ejecutiva de la fundación pero no es el último webinario de la fundación en cuanto hemos uh, apreciado en la última semana toda la importancia de eh, este instrumento y por lo tanto ya el próximo 14 de julio participaremos junto con el programa Eurosocial en eh, un webinario sobre eh, trabajo doméstico en las dos regiones. Eh, por eso eh, le invito a seguir eh, siguiendo eh, en nuestra página web en, en redes sociales eh, la programación porque eh, la fundación irá anunciando sus eh, planes eh, futuro. A partir de mañana ustedes tendrán acceso a una registración de este webinario, so starting from tomorrow, uh, you will have access to the recording of this webinar, you will find it uh, in the website of the foundation. En la misma página web de la Fundación podrán también encontrar las grabaciones de los eh, webinarios pasados que han cubierto eh, diferente eh, tema. Eh, les saludo también, saludo muy especialmente 
eh, el futuro director ejecutivo de la Fundación que eh, nos ha estado siguiendo, eh, el doctor Adrián Bonilla, que eh, la próxima semana eh, llegará a Hamburgo para asumir eh, sus funciones. Eh, muchísimas gracias. Eh, ahora voy a cerrar también eh, la encuesta y eh, muchos saludos a todos ustedes. Thank you very much and until next time. Thank you. Thank you. Muchas gracias. Mucho gusto. Bye. 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 Thank you. Gracias. Todos y todas. Gracias. Saludos. Chao. Chao. Gracias.